Hello, this is Dr. Steve Gaines from Salt Lake City, Utah. Joining us tonight is Dr. Samuel Peritzman, a urology specialist of the Carolinas. Dr. Peritzman has been a pioneer and expert in focal therapy for many years now. He's been a treating HIFU surgeon since February of 2006, and has been involved with nearly 400 HIFU cases, both out of the United States prior to FDA approval, as well as inside the United States since 2015. He's served as a proctor for HIFU Prostate Services, and also serves on the HIFU Registry Steering Committee of Sonicare Medical. Tonight, he's providing an overview of an article that was recently published in the Journal of Urology on HIFU for partial gland ablation, and will also offer his unique perspective on salvage prostatectomies and failures. Thank you, Sandy, for joining us. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And today, I'm going to be speaking on two subjects. Uh, we're going to use two published articles as sort of the uh, path to walk through these subjects. The first was a recently published article uh, from two institutions, uh, myself included, on hemigland hyphu ablation and initial outcomes from the first 100 cases. Uh, the article itself uh, is available in the journal Urology uh, back in October. Uh, so if there are things that we get through kind of quickly, you want to refer back to, that's where you can actually find the source document. Uh, HIFU, or high intensity focus ultrasound, was approved for prostate cancer ablation in 2015. The approval was for ablation, which essentially is the same approval designation we have for cryotherapy and for essentially all forms of prostate cancer, as none of them yet have a, attained a PMA. The ablation uh, is an FDA technicality that we're required to use instead of the word treatment. Uh, reports of focal HIFU performed in the United States are lacking. It has been done. There's a fair cohort of HIFU surgeons in this country. Uh, much of that work before 2015, 2004 to 2015 was done offshore and 2015 to present domestic. Uh, the objective of the study we done, which was actually just report the initial and largest US series of high intensity focused ultrasound prostate gland ablation is primary treatment for prostate cancer. This is a subset of all our patients treated. Uh, this is an IRB approval. My group has a data sharing agreement with the University of Southern California, Keck School of Medicine. There were 174 consecutive men treated. Uh, the inclusion criteria were hemigland ablations. That's a unilateral ablation of a prostate for prostate cancer. Uh, the selected men, uh, would, if they had bilateral cancer, it had to be low volume, non-dominant, and only Gleason group one or Gleason six. Excluded were patients that received other forms of ablation. That would include a whole gland ablation, salvage ablations, and subtotal ablations. Essentially, these were one side of a prostate. Uh, patients had to have a multi-parametric MRI in advance for mapping. They had both systematic and targeted biopsies. And if they had unfavorable or high-risk disease, their metastatic workup was done, same as it would be before any other form of therapy. This would be a representative case. Uh, in the top left, you see kind of a classic lesion on T2. Uh, the mid picture, you'll see it's enhancing uh, diffusion images, and then the low ADC lesion in the top right with the low ADC score. Uh, below would be the actual mapping biopsy. The HIFU we used was transrectal HIFU. This would be a Sonoblate 500, which was the vast majority of the cases. At University of Southern California, they did some ablotherm cases. Done as an outpatient, you use either a Foley catheter or based on patient preference and surgeon preference, a suprapubic tube. They do get preoperative antibiotics. TERPs were used at the discretion of the surgeon and the patient pre-procedure to enhance any outlet symptoms post-procedure. Usually that would be for very large glands. The primary endpoint for the study was treatment failure. Uh, I do wanna drill down on a couple of these concepts. That would include a Gleason group two or greater uh, residual tumor on follow-up biopsy, either in field or opposite side. 
if the patient during his follow-up period progressed and required any radical whole gland therapy, uh, if there was any systemic therapy, metastases documented, or prostate cancer mortality. Now, I would say these patients were worked up thoroughly in advance. Their follow-ups relatively short, and so as expected, we shouldn't have had any systemic failures, uh, metastatic failures, or anybody die of prostate cancer in such a short time frame as that would represent kind of gross understaging and inappropriate selection. Secondary endpoints, and we'll drill down on this later, was biochemical failure. Now, for those familiar with HIFU, you'd know there actually is no accepted criteria for HIFU hemiablation. So people either adopt one of the existing criteria that were designed for other processes, uh, but currently that's the best we have and we're collectively coming up with a better system. So for this study, we use the Phoenix criteria for those familiar with the Phoenix conference. Specifically, uh, it was not intended to be used for thermal ablations, uh, but we use it as what's available. Clinically significant prostate cancer would be a Gleason uh, group two or higher on the follow-up biopsies, that would be a secondary endpoint. Once again, with the biopsies being done at six to 12 months, if this is found, it was likely not found on the initial biopsy, not a new lesion in that short interval. Uh, if you repeated the focal, which would be, could be done on the treated side or untreated side, or progression to any radical whole gland therapy. Uh, we recorded their complications in the first 90 days, scored by the typical system. Their follow-up would be quarterly rectal exams, PSAs, and MRI at six to 12 months. Uh, biopsies were strongly recommended. Now, there was a difference between the two sites. Uh, more op biopsies were done at our site where they're really required, not recommended. They had uh, questionnaires filled out before and after therapy. And continence was defined as zero pads, no pads, not zero to one. Uh, this again would be sort of an example of a follow-up biopsy. Uh, and if you look in the bottom right, this is what you expect to see. Uh, HIFU has non-specific thermal changes. Some pathologists believe there's more elastosis in the histology than other ablations. But in essence, you're looking for fibrosis and no viable cells, benign or malignant. Uh, this is just pulled from the article, but just to really demonstrate, these were not highly selective, low risk patients. Uh, if you look at their pathology grade group, two thirds were Gleason group two and three, and there were even some Gleason group fours, some Gleason eights. Uh, and then if you look at the bottom highlighted box, you'll see if you define them as NCCN risk groups, again, over two thirds of the patients were intermediate risk. Uh, they were not very low risk or low risk dominant. And then if you look at their biopsy outcomes, uh, in essence, you can sort of summarize that whole column as 30% are gonna have a positive biopsy by two years. That's roughly split between infield persistence and a out of field or contralateral new tumor identified. If you look at uh, the group two or higher in field, it's about eight out of the 58 patients. Again, the little difference between the two institutions, but in field failures uh, are are quite uncommon, particularly if you're not taking on very large cancers, uh, very high grade lesions. If you look at some of the other metrics, uh, as I talked about earlier, biochemical failure, we still don't have an excellent definition of that. A lot of work's being done to refine it. Uh, people either use what's available, Phoenix or Stuttgart. Once again, neither of those were designed for this purpose. Uh, Radical therapy, systemic therapy, metastatic disease, uh, given the time constraints of this study, uh, should be zero as they were. If you look when all is said and done at the people that were deemed treatment failures, only one variable actually was statistically significant predicting this outcome. And that was bilateral cancer at the time of a unilateral treatment. Uh, that was the strongest predictor. 
once again, some of how well this is going to go is going to be directly related to how well these patients are diagnosed pre-treatment. How effectively are you biopsying them? And what is the quality of your MRIs? Uh, the MRI outcomes, I'll sort of glance over for, uh, for speed. What I will tell you is we have another study going where we're consolidating all the pre and post-treatment outcome uh, MRIs. And we're having a group of investigative radiologists look at them uh, because interpreting post-ablation MRIs is not something every radiologist is familiar with. And it comes with its own subtleties. And I do believe that the sensitivity will improve as the radiologists learn more and more what they're looking for in ablated tissue. Uh, complications are nominal. That's one of the reasons the patients drive this technology. Uh, no high grade complications. Uh, you can get some voiding dysfunction. That's gonna be the most common thing, some outlet obstruction. Uh, most practitioners are gonna try to optimize that pretreatment. Uh, continence, and this is a big driver for patients. Uh, continence is 100%. Uh, I actually, a few years ago, contacted Boston Scientific to see how many slings or uh, sphincters were ever sold for patients whose indication was incontinence following HIFU. There is some data collection limitations, but as far as Boston Scientific could tell me, they've never sold a device for a HIFU patient. Limitations of the study are its inherent retrospective nature, relatively short follow-up. Uh, you know, there was some uh, interest in getting U.S. patients treated in the U.S. by U.S. doctors on U.S. devices into the literature, and this was the first venture. Uh, if you look at the bottom, that just in the highlighted blue, once again, it just kind of makes the point that we really haven't figured out what is an appropriate nadir PSA with a hemiablation. Uh, the available results are that we expect a 75% reduction in PSA for a hemiablation, but is the subsequent articles gonna demonstrate we still have a lot of work to do. So in conclusions for this particular recent publication, uh, we really believe that the data represents actual current clinical practice by US urologists in the US on US patients. Most of the historic uh, HIFU published data is from Europe and Japan. The short-term results show it's a safe procedure. Potency and continence are as well preserved as any other alternative. Uh, maybe watchful waiting would do better on potency. The short-term cancer control looks good. Uh, radical treatment was avoided as expected. If you had to progress to radical treatment on such a short time frame, we need to improve uh, how well we're defining the cancer's pretreatment. The only statistical predictor of recurrence was bilateral cancer diagnosis. Next, I wanna briefly address another publication on salvage robotic prostatectomy. Uh, this is specifically following uh, whole gland, partial gland, or double ablations on only a Sonoblate 500 device. So this is a decade long uh, consecutive series by a single surgeon, uh, myself. The first uh, few years were published in the Journal of Robotic Surgery in 2017, if anybody needs to dig into that. It's currently up to 32 consecutive patients. And I wanna discuss the lessons we have learned relevant to the preceding study. So we talked about how we still have some persistent disease after hemiablations. In part, we just need to do a better job uh, working these people up in advance so that we're picking the most appropriate people. But we do need to follow them well. For every form of ablation, there is gonna be some persistences. And what we've learned in the surgical series is we need to improve how we follow them. One of the points made is of the 32 patients, 28 had sufficient PSA data to review but 16 of the 28, over half, were failures who went on to salvage prostatectomy 
yet we're not treatment failures by the Phoenix criteria. So once again, that hammers home the message that we need to refine our PSA criteria post high flu hemiablation. Very concerning is if you look at people with large recurrences, these are recurrences greater than 18 millimeters in their greatest single dimension. There were eight of those in the 32 and five of these also did not meet the definition of treatment failure by the Phoenix criteria. So once again, clearly we're having some substantial persistences and our PSA criteria are inadequate. When we look at the post hyphu tumor pathology, they've ranged from two to 38 millimeters in maximum diameter with a median of 16 millimeters at, at salvage prostatectomy. These 16 millimeter lesions, I would hope we could find earlier. If you look at how that translates to surgical pathology in salvage cases, uh, you'll see that a fair number of these are higher stage that hopefully could have been found and treated earlier. This would include nine T3As, three T3Bs. So that again is uh, over a third of the patients. And small tumors at the time of discovery and salvage treatment were relatively uncommon. So the salvage prostatectomy series suggests there's room for improvement in the treatment follow-up and to optimize the results of the salvage therapies. More assurance of successful salvage therapy will boost patient confidence in this primary treatment choice. So my biggest take home message for the second article is we do need to improve how closely we follow these patients and how aggressively we pursue their post-treatment imaging and rebiopsy. Uh, thank you for giving me the time to share this information.